Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Season 4, Episode 7 of Bell to Bell with Bobby Blaze. I am your host, Professor Jeremy Vilmer, and joining us now, Bobby Blaze. What's happening, Bobby? Hey, Professor, man. We're doing it. We're doing it. We're going to start off slow and taper down, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm here, man. Let's... Um... We're going to kick this show off bright, I hope. You know, we've uh, been doing the uh, pre-NWA, NWA, uh, AWA, and now we're up to the W. We're going to say WWE, but we're going to go back as far as the WWWF. So that's Worldwide Wrestling Federation this week. Slash right. WWE, since that's what most of the fans know it as of now. Yes. So, yeah. matter, matter of fact, I think Buddy Rogers was even pre-WWWF. I think he was Capital Wrestling Corporation or whatever. Oh, okay. I think. Cool. I, I, would, I would need to double check that, so don't quote me. But yeah, I think we even, I think we even go back before the WWW, uh, I lost track. Uh, yeah, but anyhow, three W's and an F. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. <laughs> we are going to talk about the WWE's world title and five most consequential champions. We give a little bit of a history on the title, kind of go from there. But Bobby, I, I do want to cover real quick before we get started on that. Apparently, the WWE has signed Tessa Blanchard. Oh, is that right? Yep, I just saw it on Twitter like six minutes ago. I think. Well, when we took that little break pre-recording, I was like, I wonder if anything's going on. And I did a quick scan, and I didn't see anything, so I'm glad you found something. Well, hopefully they'll use it right, you know. Huge star potential and one of, if not one of the best U.S. workers in the world right now. Put her up there, Charlotte. That'd be good, right? Oh, I would think so. And, you know, Fuck. and that four horsewomen thing starts to become a little closer to... Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. I heard uh, Jericho had a list of five people um, that he wants to bring in. Eventually, so mm-hmm. we'll see what happens there. I know one of them was Cesaro. Oh yeah, and, uh, I, I think that guy's so damn awesome, man. I'd like to see him. I don't know. It just seems like right when he's ever getting a push in WWE or whatever, or when I've seen it, man, he'll go out there and tear the house down. He's building, 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 and then boom, he just they just taper him off. Like I said earlier, you know. Yep. But I'd like to see him go somewhere. And even though I don't watch that product, we do keep up with it, um, as we talked about before. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that Tessa's going there too. So good. Yeah. And, oh, yeah, I guess the other thing we'll hit real quick, uh, the AEW side signed Eddie Kingston. I thought his first promo, I saw that uh, first promo he did. I really thought he knocked it out of the ballpark, man. Yeah. Really, he tore it up. And I'm happy for him. You know, he's been in the business like 18 years. I don't know him or anything, but I'm like, holy cow. He just tore that promo up the, the very first week he debuted. And I guess he did it uh, good again this week. I don't know. I didn't follow this week's, but I know he did sign. So that's a good thing. Yeah, that is. I mean, it's it sucks for the NWA, but they can't do anything right now anyway. So these that's guys... what I was going to bring up now. Next man, that yeah. NWA deal, Jeremy. You know, we was on that bandwagon from day one. Um, that's our group, and just you know, things are real stagnant right now. It's out of their control at this yeah, point. It really but is. Hopefully, something good's going to happen. You know. Yeah, I hope so because we'll because I really liked what they were doing. I did too, and I tell you, my whole we we kind of briefly talked about this last week, I think, if not before the NWA week. Nick Aldis, we brought him up. I just I, these people have to be getting paid. I'm sure you know the owners are you know taking care of the the, the talent is all I can hope for because if not. Have boostable travel. It may be time for uh, Audis or whoever else to say, you know, I got to get a paycheck, boss. I'm I'm going to sign with WWE or AEW or whoever's interested in me. You know, I, I think uh, Nick Aldis is in kind of a rare spot. He's married to Mickey James, who yeah. who is a you know almost a 20 year veteran of pro wrestling. Yeah, she, she is a uh, a singer. I mean, this this chick hustles 24 seven. He might be able to absorb downtime okay. he might be able to absorb enough downtime that it may not be that big of a deal because you know he made a big commitment to the nwa and he, he yeah you know he's made a big deal about wanting to see it through you know good good yeah, well, i so. hope that, i hope something takes off for them real soon though as a fan you know yeah like talked about yeah that's cool that's really good news i got one shout out this week one mm-hmm. of our listeners i heard from one of them uh my brother told me hey larry hope you're out there doing all right man larry's a, a really good dude and um met him through my brother had dinner with him maybe get to see him again here soon with the uh, depending on what the hell is going on outside here, you know, if the Corona and all that, yeah. as far as meeting up at a restaurant again or whatever, but hell, we might have to go through a drive through like McDonald's, just go to the park and eat it. But I just want to give him a shout out there. Cause he's out there busting his butt in the heat and uh, he puts some headphones on and, and cranks up the bell to bell Bobby blaze podcast. So we appreciate that. And we appreciate all the listeners and wrestling fans that do tune in because we know you've got so many podcasts and I'm, I'm, 
I love podcasts. I listen to about five or six different ones every week, and, and uh, some of them two and three times. You know, I listen to our playback just to make sure it sounds okay. But, man, um, we know you can choose podcasts anywhere, but we're glad you're listening to ours. And make sure you tell a friend about us, too. Our numbers are starting to grow again. The professor gave me an update. We're, we're not where we were at pre-corona and, and pre-little break that we had to take there. But but we're getting back up there. And, um so please be sure and tell a friend about the podcast, especially if you like old school wrestling. I think anyone likes old school wrestling will like our podcast. And yeah. people just, um, it's like two guys talking, a professor and Bobby sitting here talking. We're, you know, just like guys at the bar or riding on a road trip. And we just want you to feel like, hey, come along for a ride, man. We're all just going to have a good time here, you know, feel at home here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everybody, for listening. It is it is nice to have the uh, the opportunity to record this show again. And, yes. uh, you know, thank you guys who, who have indulged us by sticking around so long. All right, Bobby. So that being said, let's dive into the WWE as it is called yes. now. Let's do so. I know you're going to talk a little bit about belts right off the bat, maybe, cause I know you're a belt man. Um, uh, well, let's, let's be, let's be careful there. I do, I do like the belts, but I don't believe in carrying them around as a fan in public. Exactly. And I yeah. know you got the NWA replica belt, right? Yes, I do. It's the That's only the one, one I you own. have. Yeah. But you don't walk around defending it. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I was going to take it to get Sting to sign it, and then I thought, you know what, I don't want to carry this fucking thing around in public. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I didn't do that. You yeah. could carry one of these WWE ones around if you'd like. We, we'll give you a choice of, of some of the ones you've listed here that you that you might like to carry around as a fan or as a wrestler. All right, well, let's um, let's start with the one that Buddy Rogers had. Okay. What they did was they took their old U, uh, United States title, and put a plate on it that said World Champion, and that was the belt that Buddy Rogers wore as World Champion. Okay. Um, and it's worth noticing here, because this does change a couple times. He was the World Champion and not the Promotional Champion, because that does switch again. Okay. Um, the next belt that they made was the, what, they were, what we are going to call the Bruno San Martino belt. This was actually kind of an attractive belt. It had a tall center plate. It was black and gold. Um, it, I believe had the initials WWWF on it okay. and, and said world champion. That was a nice looking belt. I actually like that one. Usually you will see pictures. Usually when you see a picture, that is the belt that Bruno has, even though he possessed more than just that one. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then you get into Pedro Morales and I think they gave him a new belt every couple of weeks. <laughs> Cause he, <I'm> not... <laughs> he went through a bunch of them. There's that ugly. I don't know if you've seen this one, the green and blue one. No, no, oh. I was just going by, I was, I was looking at the notes there and started laughing when I knew what you were going to say. <laughs> Jesus Christ, this thing, it's yeah. it's got a, I think it was a blue, it looks like blue satin or something is the, where the leather would be, and then it has green trim on that. Okay. Just, I mean, it looks like, do you remember those ugly ass curtains that the people had back in the 70s? Oh, kind of like the ones I have in my home right now. Yeah, there you those, go. Yeah, yeah, like yours. Rug. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> kind of kind of look I'm like old that. I to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Um, Pedro also had another one. That, you now, this one starts heading back in a nice direction. The problem with this one is it was a gold belt with a big silver eagle. But <laughs> but the silver eagle looked like the uh, the, not, the Nazi Reichstag or what? It, the oh, Reich, yeah, it looked like a Nazi eagle. So they... Redesigned it. Now we're going to get into what they call the Billy Graham belt. When you see Billy okay. Graham, yeah. this is the belt you usually see him with. And it looks a lot like the NWA tag team titles that the um, Rock and Roll Express had. Okay. That's when I become where you're at right now is where I'm starting to become familiar with him with the Billy Graham belt. Yeah. So, you know, two guys wrestling on the top of an eagle. Uh, very, very pronounced as far as like the third dimension on it. You know, it, it okay. looks like a sculpture, basically. Um, that one is probably the one that most people would be familiar with during this time period. Uh, that one was also used by Bob Backlund. Um, but getting into Bob Backlund, we get into what they call the <laughs> big green belt. The big green belt, yep. Oh, Jesus, this thing was ugly as sin. Um, this was one Bob Backlund wore, the, the Iron Sheik had it, and it's the one that Hulk Hogan won. Um, All right. Man, that thing was ugly. I mean, it looked like the 24-7 title, but not as attractive. Yeah, I um, 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Not a whole lot to say about that one. Uh, yeah. And then we get into the Hogan 84 and 85. Basically, they look like the TV title that Arn and Tully would uh, have in the NWA, you know, where it's mm-hmm. very boilerplate, you know, the eagle, the yep. banners of the wrestling ring. Nice looking belt, but it, when your competition has it as their national title and their TV title, it does kind of bring your world title down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we get into the 86, which was more of a standard looking belt, uh, just a big globe on it. I believe WCCW's world title was very similar to it. Um, and also it's one that they had to make a Andre version of it because when they put Andre versus Hogan for the title, if Andre decides to beat you, you can't stop him. Right. And, uh, so they went ahead and made a belt just in case. Right, and sure. I re- talk and get ahead of ourselves. I rewatched that match earlier this morning between Andre and, and Hogan, and, yeah. and we'll get into that a little bit later on our podcast. But yeah, so if he if he so they had a backup belt for him just in case he didn't say yes, boss. Mm-hmm. That was pretty <laughs> much it. Because okay. no matter how big and strong you are, if Andre the Giant decided you weren't gonna win, you were not gonna win. Right. Period. Got gotcha. you. Yeah. Um, after that, we get to the Winged Eagle, which I would say is probably one of the most iconic of the WWE's title belts. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm probably mostly associated with Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, I would think. I'm drawing a blank, man. I'm sitting there. Yeah, no problem. Trying to keep my phone from falling off the damn table. It almost started vibrating. I thought it was going to interrupt the uh, podcast. I got it on silent, but I had it on the table, and it's still... Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you're familiar with the uh, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels belt. Yep. Um, and then we end up, and I guess the ultimate warrior and Hogan, you know, would probably be yeah. tied in there as well. Then we end up with the big Eagle, which I think kind of signals us going into the attitude era. This one, when I see it, it makes me think of uh stone cold and the rock. Okay. Who would then both of course have their own custom belts, right? The bowl, uh, the Brahma bowl for the rock and the skull right. and the smoking skull, I believe is what they call it for stone cold. Um, after that, we get into the Undisputed Era, which I think of two people. I think of Brock Lesnar and Chris Jericho. Yeah, I was going to say, I think of Jericho right off the bat on that one. Of course, Brock, too. But Jericho, wasn't he the, He's the, the guy first that, to, yeah. that unified him, right, at that, during that era, correct? Yep, he was the guy that, okay. that, yeah, that first did that. Um, then we get into what I think might be the ugliest piece of shit I can think of. 24-7 the, belt. Oh, okay. Second <laughs> ugliest. Second ugliest. Okay. <clears throat> the spinner belt. The yeah, John Cena yeah. spinner belt, yeah. which I think might be the longest lived belt on this list. Is that right? It was around wow. for it was around for eight years. Hmm. Um, which is a long damn time for that ugly. I mean, that thing probably cost a fortune because it was such a chunky piece of shit, but, <laughs> um, you know, they had to be amortized over a decade to get their money out of it. And then yeah. we end up in the company logo era of belts, which I am not a fan. Yeah, I'm not either. I, I hardly ever watched the product. What am I going to, you know, <laughs> and it looks like a class ring or something. I just, I'm not. I'm just not feeling it, you know. I think you've mentioned that before, the class ring. I think that's a good that's a good vibe for it right yeah. there. It looks like a class ring goes around your waist. <laughs> yeah, so, it's yeah, I just not a fan of it. So those are the major designs of the title belt, and then I got a few facts we can drop and then we can get into the personalities. Yeah, get us all caught up here. I know you've got some different things to bring up. There's been a lot of people who've been the WWE champion over time and a lot of things that come along with that. But initially it was created uh, in 1963 because the NWA didn't want to put the title on Buddy Rogers again because he rarely left the Northeast. And the NWA wanted a traveling champion. So Toots Mond and Vince McMahon Sr. withdrew from the NWA and named Buddy Rogers their first WWF or CWC, whichever it was, champion. And also started the tradition of the Battle Royals uh, tournaments in Rio de Janeiro, where all their title belts would eventually come from. (laughs) Yeah, because that's where the Intercontinental Championship uh, came from, correct? Uh, uh, Yep. um, Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson won it down there, like, whatever, like, 78 or something, whatever the year was, and Mm -hmm. whatever, I don't know what year it was, but, uh, yeah, the big tournament took place there, so... Yeah, I believe the story there was he unified the North American and the South American title. 
Okay. The the totally the factual work, people the straight yeah. shoot yeah. <laughs> the totally factual uh, titles yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, interesting. At one point, the WWF rejoined the NWA and dropped the word word world from their title. Upon really yeah, upon rejoining with the NWA, some point in the seventies that happened, I believe. PWI deranked the WWF world title in nineteen eighty two, saying that they only defend it in the Northeast against their own guys, so it is not yeah, a world true. title. And that's why we like the NWA. We go back comparing champions. You know, mm-hmm. uh, we're not going to take away any of these champions on our nope. list today. The thing is, most of those guys defended that title up and down that, that, that northeastern, you know, uh, corridor of the United States. And with the NWA champion, of course, AWA was, you know, defended pretty much worldwide as well. But the NWA, that champion, he went to every territory in the United States and Japan and, and Australia and Mexico, around the world. You know, he was a world champion. That's why we emphasized a whole lot that we, you know, really enjoyed that NWA title and why that title to us uh, as fans, it, it was the real world title. And I didn't even realize that uh, uh, the uh, PWI had, had stopped ranking them in 82, really. I didn't even know that, so thanks for bringing that to my attention. But, yeah, that's true. They mostly defended that title just up in that northeast, uh, all those northeastern cities, you know, New York, of course, being the big market, and and uh, Baltimore and D.C. And, and Philly and those places, you know, um, Boston and things. But that's where a lot of people live. They drew huge, huge crowds in that area, yep. too. You know, that's the thing. Yep. So, anyway, but, go on. Didn't mean to yeah. interrupt you. Oh, no, no, no problem. Um, I, I appreciate your input. And in 1985, they added it back to the list because by that point, they employed so many of the wrestlers and had gotten into so many territories on their own yeah. that they basically were defending on a worldwide basis again. Yeah, and they were they were traveling throughout the United States at that point. I mean, that's the thing. They got out of that northeastern corner and they started going to the bigger markets. Not that they didn't go in the past, but they, they didn't go as regular as once they become – Quote again, worldwide, you know, yeah, they, exactly. they started taking over the territories that we've talked about in the past before. So anyway, yep. good stuff, man. Good stuff. All right. Um, now, so we'll... first champion. Go mm-hmm. ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I, I know you, you talked about this man before, um, Buddy, Buddy Rogers, you, you brought him up. Um, Probably the NWA. NWA one. Okay. Yeah. I think we had him on that list for there. So here's a name that's going to come up again, but he's the first champion. It's Buddy Rogers. So oldest champion was Vince McMahon, Mr. McMahon, 54 years old in 21 days. That, to me, is wild. And if you remember, Jeremy, what kind of conditioning and shape he was in for that. Yeah. I mean, Vince, hey, I think one of them bosses that that probably said, look, you know, I'm not asking anyone in this company to do anything I wouldn't do, and I'll do what you do. And I think that's pretty damn ballsy. And that Mr. McMahon character, it got over huge. We, we've we actually had him on a list before as a commentator, too. Yep. So we're not here browbeating. That's one kind of preface it, some of the stuff we may say in the next little bit. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to browbeat or shit on the WWF a whole lot. But but uh, Jeremy and I was talking off the air here. And, of course, I want, let me put this up. Thank you for all the notes, Professor. We've combined some. But you had about 75% of these this week, and I appreciate it very much. But, uh, yeah, we just um, – we may be bigger fans of other organizations than we are the WWE. So uh, if we say something a little bit out of character for us today, because I don't know how much of a heel Jeremy's going to be today. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the faster so far has kept it really professional, and I respect that. But, yeah. So, anyway, we got the – I was just getting to the point of uh, McMahon being the oldest champion. Take from there, Jeremy. <laughs> Who's the youngest champion? Uh, the youngest champion would have been – well, is it Brock Lesnar is who I had on the list, but wasn't Randy Orton younger than See, him? See, I thought Randy Orton was uh, about 20 or 23 when he got it. I know it listed uh, 25 and 44 days for Brock, but I'm pretty sure, and y'all can fact check us out there, hit us up if you want. Uh, I thought Randy Orton was younger. Yeah, I uh, think I think Randy Orton. I think yeah. I I think I got the wrong name on here. Yeah, wherever, sure it's Randy. Yeah, yeah, because you know what? That, that was a big deal when Brock left. They wanted to put it on somebody younger, and it was Randy Orton. That's absolutely uh, true. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, well, this is what I get for using uh, Wikipedia as one of my sources. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Someone probably went in there and changed that, you know, right when you was getting your notes. Probably. But, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's Randy, um, in uh, all seriousness. Yep. Uh, then we go to Heaviest. Who was that? Yokozuna. Yep. Uh, how are you saying? Uh, Yokozuna. 568 pounds. Man, that's incredible. And that guy can move still, man. I mean, he's big as a sumo, but he moved a hell of a lot more space than a sumo wrestler had to move, you know? Damn, man, what a big guy. How he didn't hurt someone or crush someone's chest, I don't know. 
I don't know. I don't, I don't know because that guy was carrying a lot of mass around and I don't know, you know, I don't know how you would do that without, because all it would take is a slight fuck up and you could kill somebody. Yeah. It shows how talented he was though. Yeah. So he's the heaviest. Who was the lightest? The lightest would be Ray Mysterio Jr. at 175 pounds. And hell of a, hell of a, uh, performer, worker, wrestler, what you want to say in that, he, that guy can get over, man. And move. I mean, he just, yeah. he, now, of course, you know, he's, he's still a youngish man and he can barely walk because of some of this shit, but yeah, you know, still, I mean, he was in his day, he was incredible. I mean, you know, he still is now. I mean, yeah. to, to be honest, longest reigning, who would that have been? Oh, that would have been a great Bruno San Martino for 2,803 days. Um, I knew it was a shitload of days. I didn't know how many until you wrote it down there. But, yeah, Bruno, of course, he's their, he was their champion for years. That's that's where the money was at was on him, man. Well, I was going to say uh, just real quick there. I think the only people that are in that kind of time frame with a world title are Bruno, Lufez, and, of course, Vern Gagne. Yeah, yeah. Who Good are call. just, yeah, yeah that, that nearly 3,000 days as champion. I think those are the only three that are in there. And, and that's immediately who would come to my mind, and I think most of our fans might be those three as well. Yeah. So, good deal. And the shortest title reign? <laughs> that would be Andre the Giant. And the yeah. time I've got here is one minute, 48 seconds, which is a very short period of time to be champion. And that's when he handed over DiBiase, correct? Yes, that would be when he just gave okay. it away. There you go. So it could have been two minutes, folks. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there might be a little a little lag time in there somewhere. Kind of a brief rundown of the WWE belts there. Um, I know we've got a couple of mentions before we get into our, our top five, who we feel, you know, quintessential champions of the WWE. For that, though, Jeremy, mm-hmm. how about you tell us a little bit about, shit, I'm drawing a blank, Anchor, <laughs> Anchor FM. I'm sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me. Oh, yeah. But, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit, tell the fans a little bit about Anchor FM if you don't care. There you go. Okay, let's go on to our mentions, and I guess I'll go from here because you've done most of the talking here of all your fact-checking notes, which, again, I sincerely appreciate. I'm going to mention a man here that was a WWF champion that probably didn't get enough recognition as the WWF champion. A lot of people come to know who he, who he was through the years. I found it really funny uh, what it said on a Wikipedia page about him. This is Ivan Koloff, also known as a Russian bear, and he beat uh, Bruno Sarmatino. So with that said, what I found was funny was on a wiki page, it said that the great Ivan Koloff, the Russian bear himself, was best known for his WWF title win. I don't think that's true at all. Do you? I I don't think so. And I think we'd have to talk to Nikita and Crusher Khrushchev to make sure. But I knew, you know what? I was probably in my 30s before I even knew he had ever been WWF champion. I think I was already in business before I knew it, too. I mean, you know, being around the boys and stuff. But, yeah, apparently, um, well, not apparently. In January 18th, 1971, uh, Koloff defeated defeated, uh, Sarmartino in Madison Square Garden after a pinfall from a knee drop from the top rope. Uh, ending Sarmatino's seven and two third years reign. So that's pretty cool. Of course, Koloff lost the championship 21 days later to Pedro Morales. So he was a transitional champion, if you will. But nonetheless, he was a fucking WWF champion and he should have been in a Hall of Fame. He should be in every Hall of Fame there is. Here's the thing. You said, you can, our fans, I guarantee you, they know him outside of just being uh, the WWF champion beating Bruno. That's a great accomplishment. But, man, he was a hell of a performer. He took his serious. He took his mm-hmm. gimmick so serious. He had that tattoo on his arm of the, the, the sickle cutting off the eagle head. I mean, you, you just talk about getting over as the years and years of the evil Russian Empire, you know, the great Ivan Koloff who become Uncle Ivan to so many people throughout the, the years um, as he got older, of course. But I think we need to give him a little bit of recognition. That's why I put him on my honorable mentions list there. If you, that was my guy for honorable mentions, folks. Could you imagine being in Madison Square Garden on the night Bruno San Martino lost the title to a fucking, oh my God. to a commie? Yes, in 1971. Jesus Christ, that would have yeah. been, yeah. I, I'm surprised we don't hear about the riots that night, you know. We all just know who he is, and I think he deserves, you know, more. I don't know why he, he's not in there, you know, Hall of Fame or whatever. I don't know if there's any heat there or what the whole deal was or, or whatever. But man, he's a well-deserving man, a great champion, and, uh, of course, just um, very well thought of throughout the industry. I know that. Very well respected. Okay, so my my honorable mention is going to go to Hossein Khosrow Ali Vaziri, better known as... 
the Iron Sheik, or Sheiky Baby. Ha, ah, Sheiky Baby. Good one. Good one, Professor. This guy is just oozing with legit wrestling background. I, you know, uh, he's, I believe he he was on the Olympic uh, training team. He trained wrestlers. He was a, he was a bodyguard for the fucking Shah of Iran before the revolution. Yep. And what shocked me, I didn't know this. He's part of that Minnesota crew. Oh yeah. Yeah. I knew that. He yeah. trained up there, burning them. Um, I think also uh, Billy Robinson, he trained with them guys up there. I always used to do the Hindu squats and stuff. I've, I've heard that he was really, I mean, I've, I've met him a couple of times and he used to do the clubs. Of course, everyone knows him with the Iranian, you know, the Indian clubs doing the clubs over his head to train with and stuff like that. I was on a couple of shows with them, uh, up in Ohio, as well as down in Georgia. Uh, just a funny guy to be around. You, you make you laugh in a locker room, just like, you know, just like what you see. Of course, he's getting up in his years now, but really a funny guy. I know I was in a locker room in um, Columbus, Ohio, actually, and he uh, he was talking about the clubs, and there was a couple younger guys in, in the locker room. Of course, none of us tried them or anything like that. I, I hadn't been to Japan yet because that's where I learned to work them out when I was over there. Uh, but he had these huge clubs. And he started talking about no one, no one do, you know, because he's going to do the contest out there in the ring uh, where, you know, do the fan challenge. And I said, um, Sheiky, no disrespect. I just met him that day. And, you know, we're just talking in the locker room. He'll locker room. I said, no disrespect, but um, I do know a man that can do those clubs. And he just looked at me, you know, oh, yeah, you know, and like, you know, how he talks. And um, I said, yeah, and I said, uh, he said, no, man. And I, I think he knew, you know, like just, just ribbing around, you know, yeah, he was yeah. ribbing, ribbing the guys. And I said, yeah, I said, I think I do. And he looked at me and I said, Carl Gotch. He goes, oh, God damn, Carl Gotch. Carl Gotch. He, he could do anything. And he just started putting over Carl about, yeah, he could do this and he could do that. And it was just really funny, man, because he changed his tune. He goes, you know Carl? And I said, well, I don't know, know him, but, yeah, I've met him several times down in Tampa. And uh, we, we said, I sit there and had a real nice conversation with him. It was really, just really funny. And then I said, he's there like three days or whatever, and each night, you know, it's kind of laughing. It was a good thing to be, you know, to, to have that little, just that little bit of a connection that, you know, he's up there traveling, doing his thing. And then I saw him at a show down in, um, down in Georgia, Cordell, Georgia. I was down there for like peach, uh, peach tree wrestling way back in the day. And, uh, these kids come around the corner and they use the F word. <laughs> Scott Steiner was down there. He's doing his biceps, you know, pumping his biceps up. Sheik was at this outdoor show, by the way, just to know I'm going with Sheik's out there doing his clubs. And these kids come around teenagers, you know, probably 13, 14, 15 year old kids, they started yelling, you know, this is this is the, the F word, the F word, you know. So, uh, Sheiky put the gloves down. He goes, hot, hot to it. Uh, what's wrong with you? Uh, you use the, you say a fake. Is your parents fake? Is your school fake? Is your books fake? You get the fuck out of here. You know? <laughs> and he just started rapping these kids. They start like, they just never forget it. It's like in a sequence of, are your parents fake? Are your schools fake? Are your books fake? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> That is so it's funny. It's just really funny, man, to be around him. Great guy. Uh, training, I mean, I think AAU champion, world champion of AU. I think he was in the Pan, uh, Pan American Games, too. As You know, like I said, training, uh, coached some of the Olympic uh, guys back in the day. Mm -hmm. Just a uh, great, great amateur background, like you said. Legitimate, too. You know, legitimate, legitimate bodyguard. <laughs> Tough as nails. And, of course, yeah. you know. During the period of time, you know, for younger younger people who don't remember this, but during the period of time where he became world champion, there had just been a revolution in Iran where it be went from a friendly government that the British and Americans had put in place over there to a non-friendly religious theocracy that had taken a bunch of Americans hostage. Yep. So we're talking just heat all yeah. the way around. I mean, just, you know, probably one of the most hated men in the world in that profession at that time. And I rewatched that match earlier today too, good Hogan and, um, the Sheik in Madison square garden. And, uh, I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later on down through here. So mm -hmm. yeah, just the heat that he had, man. Heat oh yeah. The Sheik. <laughs> yeah. Of course he was a real brief champion. He was basically a way to get the title from Bob Backlund to Hulk Hogan. Backlund was not going to lose to a non-wrestler. Right. Uh, matter of fact, they even, uh, they even, they kind of went around Bob Backlund by having Arnold Scullin throw in the towel instead yes. of having him quit or get pinned too. So they kind of, they protected him, you know, they yeah. protected him on his way, on his way out of the title scene there. 
And I wish the business did that more and more nowadays too. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, um, it tells what we're going to come to next. That's why I said that. Yeah. The next well, little segment is what, Jeremy? <laughs> well, this is this is the grumpy old fans part where we're going to kind of talk about something. You know, Bobby, doing the research for this episode, I discovered something about myself. Yeah. What's that? I'm not a huge fan of the WWE. Not nearly as big as I am about uh, of a fan of the NWA and the AWA, anyways. Yeah, I kind of found that, too, and here we are, the grumpy old men. Like I said, I wish they had more respect, protected the business better, or the titles, since we're talking titles, we'll say titles, mm -hmm. make them more meaningful stuff. Like you said, just brought up the uh, thrown in the towel there to protect Bachlin. That's the way it should be. That's kind of, you know, we was talking off there. I couldn't word it as, as nicely as you did. I went back and watched the, uh, the Sheik Hogan match. You know, to me, it's just like I tried to put myself in a mindset that I was when I actually watched it when it took place in, in 1984, when Hogan Hogan got the championship off the Sheik. Place is going nuts before the match, you know, so to not take anything away from the, the, the wrestling, the world of wrestling. It's in Madison Square Garden. You know, crowd's hot and fire, man. I mean, it, then I try to even go back to, like, if I was 10 years old watching that, you know, just even younger, and I just really, the whole match is only, like, five minutes and eight seconds. It's um, not a bad match. It's not a great match. To me, it's more like a cartoon match, you know, and I, I don't mean that really disrespectfully, but I guess I am saying that because... The, the 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 wrestling I was used to and brought up on the way I think it should be is, is not who they book for. And, of course, we're going back to 84, and I was just, you know, like 20, 21 years old at that time. Yeah. I could just tell, you know, that this wrestling was different because I only saw the WWF – uh, when I was 15, and then again when I was about 18. So I only saw it for a couple of weeks when I was up east. Um, uh, like I said, as a teenager, for for one summer, I saw it a few weeks there. But it wasn't until I got about 20, 21, around this time, 83, 84, I lived in Maryland for just uh, maybe about eight months or so. It just wasn't the same to me. And I watched that match today, and it still just wasn't the same. Not saying it wasn't a good match or anything. It just it made me realize what a fan I am of, like you said, the AWA and the NWA especially over the WWF and then doing this research and stuff. And, and uh, again, not, not here being the, the angry old man, but yeah, it's just one of those things. I don't know. Go on a grump a little bit, Jeremy. I don't, I don't want to say because you worded it and kind of talked me down from saying a few things before we went on the air about it. There's a five minute rant of us on YouTube, just going into why the WWE hates wrestling and all the evidence that we can put there. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of, I don't. Let me give out that address real quick. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On our YouTube channel, just so you know, if you go to uh, tinyurl.com slash video, you can find that rant on there, and it's a pretty damn good rant, man. I have to say, you got over that day huge as a heel. It was really killer. If, you know, just go to YouTube and type in, you know, the, the Bobby Blaze, um, uh, Bell to Bell Bobby Blaze podcast, but use that shortcut that our good friend Tex Johnson down in the broiler room set up for us. Uh, but we have uh, the professor set up the uh, – tinyurl.com slash bbbb video and it'll take you to some of the uh, work that uh, Jeremy and I did behind the scenes and that the uh, uh, text put together on video uh, that you can see our rant on this. But anyway, go ahead. Let me interrupt. Just want to give out our oh, YouTube. Oh, that's that's, new that's listeners. yeah, that's, that's totally, a good rant. <laughs> it is. It um, you know, I, I have to pat myself on the back a little bit for that yes. because it's not one. I didn't have a plan to anything. There were no bullet points. I just kind of. Shot we my mouth off. We were just talking and you went off. You yeah. Know? Um, so the thing is, is that, okay, and, and, and don't get me wrong. There's a reason the WWE exploded while everybody else didn't. I mean, this must have been like the product that people were looking for. Uh, Vince McMahon was a visionary and he was doing shit that nobody else could, you know, predict or account for him taking a risk on. WrestleMania, everything he did paid off. But it's not for me. It's, it's right. not, yeah, it's not something I enjoy. Um, especially, and the reason I wanted to hit this now is there, there's going to be a lack of recent WWE champions on here. Yes. And yeah. look, I mean, here's some things. Okay. Uh, John Cena, 16 time world champion. That was, you know, it used to be a huge deal that Harley Race was an eight time world champion. And just to shit on people's legacy, I think they threw it on to Cena 16 times, you know? They don't protect their champions, they don't protect their titles, they don't protect the belts. You know, it just, they, they're a cheap fucking bobble used to get people <laughs> over and sell a fucking trinket, you know? That's all they are now. Yeah, yeah. 
Man. And that's not to take anything from the hard work at John Cena, the work, no. the hard work, respect, hustle, and all that. We're not saying that at all, man. The guy, you know, he carried the company there for several years mm-hmm. on his back, uh, and just through the years, he's a. I don't. I won't say he's the best worker, but he's a hell of a good worker, and he works his ass off. Got a hell of a physique, and can talk his ass off. So he's over and all three of what it takes to be a great wrestler. And I know he's moved on to moving on, uh, you know, to to movies and TV and everything else, and that's great. It's just that you're going to see there's an absence of some of the current uh, day wrestlers on our list for a reason, and that's because the professor and myself are being grumpy old man. Mm-hmm. And, and I guess the best thing we can say is. Get off my damn lawn, you know. <laughs> damn kids. I'm a I'm a Miller. I drink Miller, Miller Light. I don't have one right now, but I'll gladly take a PBR. Uh, pass Blue Ribbon for you uh, young kids out there, or uh, whatever you. If you don't know what the fuck a PBR is, fuck you. You shouldn't be listening to this podcast. But I'll gladly sit there with my PBR and say, "Get off my lawn." When it comes to professional wrestling. <laughs> That's it. That is yeah. it. That's kind of where we're starting from. Okay, Bobby, before we get into our special mention and our top five list, uh, not only are you a podcaster, a former wrestler, a wrestling consultant, you are also an author. I've written a couple books and a couple of e-books and short stories. My first book is called Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boost, Will Travel. If you'd like to get that book, let me tell you a way to get it. There are all my books are available on Amazon, but the great professor here has set up a little link. If you use this link, this podcast gets a little bit of kickback, and we appreciate any kind of kickback we can get. But if you go to tinyurl.com slash blazebook1, that'll take you right to the Amazon link where you can get Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boost for Travel. It talks about my breaking into the business, growing up, breaking into the business, some of the travels throughout the world to England, South Africa, Australia, Japan, and all these different trips I took and working for Smoky Mountain Wrestling and the title, uh, winning the title there. Except the second book... It's called I Kicked Out on Two, The Educational Wrestler. Once again, if you'd like to, you can get on Amazon. It's available on Kindle, download, or in print edition. And the way you can get a print edition that, again, would help this show get some kickback is this. Go to tinyurl.com slash blazebook2, and we'd appreciate that very much. The professor will get a little bit of kickback from his Amazon affiliate account. Uh, he may or may not smile. I don't know. Sounds like he might not be smiling too much this week when we do this list. Uh, but I'll at least get a, a book sale and I'll get a smile. And while I'm thinking about it, if you want to really give me a smile, if you read one of my books or one of my short stories, please leave a review. Just like you can leave a review for this podcast. We'd appreciate it very much. And that's my spew, man. So go out there, go to tinyrail.com slash blazebook1 or tinyrail.com slash blazebook2 and pick up a copy of either Pin Me, Pay Me, Have Boost with Travel or I Kicked Out on Two, The Educational Wrestler. And we'd all be appreciative. We'll all walk away at the end of the day a little bit more happy, hopefully, than what we may be now because we're grumpy old men (laughs) <laughs> this guy here, you know, he was kind of the future of wrestling. He was ahead of his time. We're talking about superstar Billy Graham. Yeah, man, it's the superstar. Yes. Yeah. You know, he, he was colorful. He was great on a mic. He was really the first or one of the first bodybuilder pro wrestlers who just came out and just looked like they were fucking chiseled out of granite, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, he trained with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I've heard a story early on uh, about him walking on Venice Beach with uh, the great Arnold Schwarzenegger. And uh, all these fans just come running over there at Muscle Beach. And Arnold thought this for him because, you know, he was a Mr. Olympia. And he had already won a couple of them at that point. And... Uh, he thought all these fans are coming to see me and they ran up and they saw the superstar and they started putting over superstar Graham when he was out there working in California. I thought that was pretty cool, man. Uh, of course, he named after the Reverend uh, Billy Graham out of respect for that. Mm-hmm. And also that song, Jesus Christ Superstar, you know, and their yep. superstar Billy Graham. Of course, he was a kayfabe brother of Dr. Jerry Graham, Eddie and Luke Graham. And just basically an iconic figure in professional wrestling. We thought we better put him on this list. Uh, just because, like you said, man, if it wasn't for him with the tight eyes and the, uh, the 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 big muscles and also learning to get a, well not even learn he probably did it naturally getting over like he did with the speaking the way he did you know yeah. one of those things uh, there probably wouldn't be a Hulk Hogan or Jesse Ventura or a lot of other you know uh, guys Scott like Steiner. that. There you go. Yeah, it's yeah. Pop a Pump, you know. Yeah, Graham beats uh, Martino in um, 1977 in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he held it for nine and a half months. He wrestled throughout, you know, all over the world. One of the other stories I heard about him was because he was a former football player, too, and he, he tried out with, um, I guess he worked out a little bit in the um, the dungeon with Stu, 
and he still didn't like non wrestlers, I guess, or footballers. And I heard that this is all just hearsay. So if you hear something else, that's fine. Let me know. But I read this way back when, and like uh, maybe the Wrestling Observer done a special on him. It's just something I read. But he apparently took a bunch of razor blades and taped them to his fingers. And he was afraid if he got in that dungeon, Stu was going to beat the hell out of him. He was going to cut himself, cut his way out of there, he said. Uh -huh. now, I don't know how true that is or not. It could have been a work or whatever. But I do know he was going to, you know, go as a football player down into the dungeon. And he was a little bit nervous about Stu stretching a big muscle man out. Um, and, and so I don't know. Again, it could be just, you know, some someone made that story up. But, um, yeah, Superstar Graham, man, had to look, the body, and could talk and um, just – over <laughs> yeah absolutely i remember there's there was one match i watched of uh they brought dusty Rhodes up from florida to wrestle uh, superstar in madison square garden and yeah. i remember there was there was one comment that i saw it just said there is more charisma in that ring right then than there is in the entire wrestling business now yeah yeah that's good that's yeah. real good that's true too man think about that and i think they wrestled like three times i'm not sure dusty and, and uh superstar yeah, i think and it, it was three okay and if you watch if you watch those matches they i'm not making a dig on dusty or superstar brother they don't do anything and everything they do is so over because they don't do anything. You know what I'm saying? Like they do a top wrist lock and it's over. Mm -hmm. They do a headlock and it's over. They didn't have to is my point. I, that's why I'm saying I don't want people to think I'm browbeating a match when I say they didn't do anything. It's because they didn't have to. That was all the talk, all the hype, and, and, and two, like you said, superstar, more more talent, you know, in that ring. And like I said, just a, a simplest of move, just when a lock up, the people popped every friggin' time, man. That To me, I, that's getting over. Yeah, that is absolutely. That's over. Like I said, that's uh, they did what they had to do to keep it over. They didn't have to go in there and do uh, twenty-five punches to the head or ten in the corner or a bunch of super kicks or slam each other. They just done the simplest of moves, and every time one done something to the other, the fucking woo, you know, the roof come off, so to say. So yeah, that's why he was our also mentioned on here. We couldn't we could not leave him off this list. It's kind of a way of getting her back to, which we'll eventually get to in next season. We'll be getting back to some of our top tens why we like uh, this person or why we love that person and some things like that. We've already got some great ones lined up. But uh Superstar Graham maybe someone we take a look at too, Jeremy. You never know. Oh yeah. Uh, definitely yeah. should be on the list. Um yeah. yeah and this look this season, you know, we kinda we kind of slapped it together initially back in June where I can't even remember. I saw you say something to somebody on Twitter, and that's when I messaged you. I'm like, fuck it. Let, what do you say? Let's just yeah. put the show back together. Yeah. So I had been working on an idea to delve into the championship as a solo show that I was going to do on YouTube. Right. But since I already had some of the research in place, I figured let's just roll it into the show, and then we'll we'll figure out if we're going to do a format change afterwards. So that's that's why we're a little bit different. I have heard from several people that they like this format, though. Good. Good. Yeah. And um, I – Again, to be a little bit redundant, we're going to go back to several top tens on our. We have got some plans on the next few weeks. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, I'm glad some people are liking this format, man. We appreciate it. Yeah. Um. Try not to. Try not to. Try not to say as many f bombs, and that's hard for me to do. Yeah. And I me know too. it's sometimes hard for a professor, but um, we're, we're doing that for a reason too, because hopefully we'll get some more fans that we don't have to put. Uh, and it's not all about the fans. It's just us being us. Like I said, we're a couple guys sitting at the bar, having a couple beers, talking wrestling, or driving down the highway to the next town to, to get to our next booking. And you're just long for a ride, and we hope you put your input in too. And the way you can do it is hit us up on Twitter and let us know. You can hit Jeremy up at the Geek is Cast on Twitter. You can hit me up at Bobby Blaze 744 on Twitter. You can also hit up the joint account at Bell to Bell Blaze on Twitter and let us know what you think, man, because we do like our fan interaction. We appreciate any kind of insight you give to us because, you know, that's what we do it for. We just love wrestling and we hope you're enjoying a ride along with us. Or uh, I'm not today. I don't think the professor is. I'd tell you if I was. I'm not having a beer right now, but sometimes we'll just get on here and have a beer and hey, it's just a couple guys talking, you know, and uh, we want you to feel like you're just one of the guys uh, having a soda or having a beer with us. But the point being, uh, on the F bombs, we're trying not to. So, <laughs> using Anchor and also, you know, we're available on iTunes and Google Play and all these other wherever you get your your fucking podcast at. I'll yep. just say that um, because we got to put the word. Uh, uh, what is it, Jeremy? You told me explicit. <laughs> well, yeah. So our shows so carry an explicit. Yeah. yeah, they carry the explicit, which means that iTunes and other people push us less. 
to people because, you know, recommend us less because, yeah. you know, let's face it. We don't, we probably don't need 14 year olds listening to you and me <laughs> talk about being right. backed up or whatever the fuck is shot out of somebody's <laughs> mouth here recently, you know? But, um, yeah. So, I mean, if we could, if we could clean up, we'd reach a larger audience, but you know what? We're not going to change who we are either. So if we can do it without breaking our necks, we'll try. And if not, yeah. we're just going to keep doing the stuff we do. Yeah, I'm not going to guarantee there's not being yeah. F-bombs dropped, <laughs> but <laughs> we're trying, people. <laughs> Indeed. We're just glad you like it and glad you like the format. And um, anyway, with that said, I think it's time probably to get into our top five. I'm going to let you go with number five because I know this was your man that you 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 just – you we've brought him up what this is like the third time we brought him up now from mm-hmm. the NWA to the top of this uh, podcast you mentioned him and that's number five the Nature Boy Buddy Rogers tell us about yeah him. the the original Nature Boy he is the guy who defeated Pat O'Connor for the NWA title now you you'll remember Pat O'Connor because that was the guy they wouldn't give a title shot against for Vern Gagne causing him to leave the NWA they put the title on Buddy Rogers the NWA title. And then notice he didn't leave the Northeast. So uh, a couple fellas, and you may know these names, Bill <laughs> Miller and Carl Gotch confront Rogers in Columbus. And, yeah. uh, and well, Nature Boy leaves with a broken hand. Who knows what happened? Probably and, tripped over a bench. Yeah, probably. And then uh, up in Montreal, uh, he got sidelined by Killer Kowalski. So he had to take some time down after that and lost the title to Luthez in 63, which continued, I believe, a lifelong feud between Rogers and Fez. Mm-hmm. I believe this thing is something that went on for their for their entire lives. Um, I had always heard, I didn't know for sure, and I can't find anything that indicates otherwise. Nature Boy Buddy Rogers created the figure four leg lock. Yep, I saw that in your notes there. I don't know. As far as I know, that's who that's who they say it is. That's mm-hmm. who it was that invented it. So we'll go with that and. Uh, I'm sure someone will find some footage from Mexico or Japan or somewhere, and they'll send it out there on Twitter or YouTube or whatever you want to do. But uh, that's what we're going to go with for right now. The yeah. Um, Buddy Rogers invented the figure four leg lock. And I'm sure that somebody will be able to find maybe a standing figure four or something along those yeah. lines. Yeah. Um, but going off the research I could find all the way back to 1957, they have recordings of matches of him winning by submission via leg lock in newspapers and things. Now, that doesn't mean it was the figure four necessarily, but we have footage in 1961 of him using the the figure four leg lock as we know it today. There you go. Uh, He started to have chest pains while he was WWF champion. So they put him on a lighter schedule, shorter matches, and uh, had Bruno beat him in a two or three minute match for the title. Yeah, yeah. Um, You know, he, I don't know, I would say, you know, he should probably be better known than he is. But of course we have another nature boy who took the name, did. the attitude and the figure four and blew it up into something huge. So I maybe, say did quite well for himself. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe, maybe compared to the bright sun that is Ric Flair you know, nature boy, Buddy Rogers just gets lost over the ages, yeah. you know? And I happen to know a couple other nature boys too. Of course, I got to know the nature boy, Buddy Landell, when mm-hmm. I was down in Tennessee. I, I, I knew him very well, of course. But I also knew, uh, nature boy, Goldie Rogers up in Canada. And, and Goldie was a hell of a good dude, man. But he had this long bleached blonde hair, but he had a black beard. But he told me way back when, when he was breaking into business, he's about 19 years old. And, uh, when he took that name, the nature boy, Goldie Rogers, sometimes when he'd go to a little territory, and back then they had a West Virginia uh, little territory up in Oak, Oak Hill, West Virginia, Ashton, Kentucky, Charleston, Huntington, some of these little towns around here. And, uh, this was one of the first areas he worked. Uh, and I, I, Felt you know connected to Goldie that way because he actually knew where the hell Ashland, Kentucky was at. Yeah. But one of the funny stories was he said when he'd go to some of the bigger towns, especially in the Northeast, some of the veterans would say, "Goldie, um, <laughs> Buddy Roger in the building night, he's looking for you." Took his name and Goldie, <laughs> he, they'd work him, they'd work him, you know, and he'd, he'd buy it every time. He said, you know, because he is so fucking scared that you know Buddy Roger is going to show up and whip his ass for taking the name. But he said, "That's not why I did it," you know, "That's not why I did it." But I guess it um, one of those things, you know, just just that nature boy gimmick. Uh, I might as well mention too. There's another nature boy, Paul Lee, down in uh, Georgia, Tennessee. Or I think he lives in Georgia, but he worked down in Tennessee and Georgia, all throughout the South. There, uh, 
uh, that's pretty funny. So, yes, several Nature Boys, but, of course, we're going to go up the main one, Nature Boy Buddy Rogers here as our top five because we're doing a WWF slash E title, so we're going to keep him a number five there. Yeah. Uh, and hope you like our order and hope you like who we picked. If not, again, just let us know, man. We're open to suggestions and controversy. <laughs> yep, that's right. Uh, of course, now I did discover – <laughs> there was a battle of the nature boys, Buddy Rogers versus Ric Flair at some point in the seventies. And that's where he passed over to, uh, yep. for sure that he said, you know, this is the nature boy. He gave him that gimmick bestowed upon him yep. directly. Okay. So really two nature boys, <laughs> Buddy Rogers and Ric Flair. Yeah. And I believe there was a later battle of the nature boys between Buddy Landell and Ric Flair. Wasn't there? Yes. Yes. There yeah. was. Yeah. So, but we'll talk about that some other time. So from there, we're going to end. This stays in uh, in order of title holders as well. We're going to go with the legendary Bruno San Martino. Had one of the longest WWF slash WWE title reigns in history. He first got uh, turned on a weightlifting arrest as a young kid. He bench pressed, what was that, way back in 1959. He bench pressed six, 565 pounds. Uh, what I was going to mention earlier was the Italian uh you know, where he's Italian, that ethnic, and that's the whole thing up there in the Northeast. And we were talking mm-hmm. earlier about defending a title up there. I'm going to let you come back and talk a little bit about San Francisco and some other places. But um, that was the whole thing. Some of those towns I mentioned, of course, New York, you know, the stronghold there, of Madison Square Garden with all the, the immigrants and the Italians there. They, they had ethnic champions, you know what I'm saying? We talked about Pedro earlier uh, yep. getting beat by uh, – uh, or beating Ivan Koloff, rather, uh, those type things. And, and here you had a Russian, Ivan Koloff, beating an Italian. Like you said, you would hate to be in a building at night, the heat that, that oh, uh, yeah. Ivan would have had, you know, because uh, uh, not speaking out of school, it's just the way times were. The ethnicity of that time, those northeast cities, you know, from Boston, Baltimore, like I said, Detroit, Philly, down that way, and then, of course, your mainster right there, the you know, greatest uh, well-known uh, sports arena in the world at Madison Square Garden, that, and that's where the majority of the people lived at that time. Yep. You know, and so that was their Italian strongman, and uh, uh, cheered for him, you know, and, and Bruno was over that way, and all, like I said, just uh, one of the longest title reigns ever. And we talked about that earlier. So anyway, what else about the uh, great Bruno that that we haven't talked about, Jeremy? Anything special? Well, you know, um, so he was going to leave the Northeast at one point and actually go to work for Roy Shire over here in San Francisco. Okay. Okay. Uh, But somehow he got booked for two dates at the same time in Boston while he wasn't in that state and got blacklisted and couldn't wrestle in America because all the promoters had agreed that if if you stiff a promoter in one area, we all blacklist you. Okay. So Bruno had to go to Canada for a while and kind of stay up there until he had paid his penance, basically. Nice. Okay. So how long did he work at a certain Calgary, or do you know where he worked you at? No. Um, uh, yeah. Toronto, maybe over in Toronto, some or something. I, I thought it was the Montreal area, but you know, what, Bobby. Okay, of course, that I. Makes sense. Of course, I didn't write it down. Um, no, that's okay. I just, I just, I'm thinking he oh, had to probably go over to Montreal and Toronto and and some of those bigger cities. What I would think to in order to make a you know living, what you know if if I remember right, it was the Tunney family, so it was probably based out of Toronto. See, that's what I was thinking. I mean, I wasn't trying to put you in a spot because I didn't yeah. even know this history. I was just thinking being more northeast and being, you know, not too far from New York there. He had to probably work in Toronto or somewhere. I wouldn't think you'd be out in British Columbia or, or Calgary or somewhere. You know, I just – Yeah. Uh, Van- Vancouver or wherever I was uh, in British Columbia and then Calgary, I was thinking. And maybe – some of those towns on the, out on the northeast, you know, Halifax or somewhere. But I was had to, I was thinking it had to be Montreal or Toronto, and I just I'd say you know, common sense would probably tell us that he probably stayed up there and probably was protected in the Toronto area. I would imagine. Yeah, uh, if I remember right, it was bit. it was for the Tunney family, so okay. I believe I believe okay. they were headquartered out of Toronto at the time. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good deal, man. Great Bruno San Martino, number four. And you want to go on from here? You know what? I, I just wanted to reflect on something real quick before we did, because okay. this will come up again when we talk about Hulk Hogan. Um, during this time, Irish was considered a non-white ethnicity. Italian was considered a non-white ethnicity. Uh, Puerto Rican. Basically, if you were a Catholic in this country in the 1960s, you were not part of mainstream white Anglo-Saxon Protestant society. Um uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, back then, remember, I mean, we no, I had we're, to wash my room. Oh, sorry. <laughs> but, you know, we're too young to actually have been there for it. But remember yeah. when John Kennedy ran for president, people are like, we can't have a Catholic as president. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
remember my mom telling me about that. I was born that year, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just kind of wanted to, you know, just like how much this country has changed that now, you know, none of those things would be considered like particularly ethnic in any way, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, from there, we are going to go to the Opie Taylor of <laughs> pro wrestling, the great Bob Backlund. Yes. Howdy doody. Right. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so Backlund, man, he won the title February 20th, 1978 at Madison Square Garden, man, getting a pinfall over. We talked about superstar Billy Graham to win the title, man. Uh, they said that Billy Graham's foot was on a rope, uh, but, you know, whatever. But anyway, Backlund had the uh, his first title reign with a second um, in WWF history, only second to Bruno's run. Yep. And, um I remember him being a champion because that was the years I was up there. I was talking about being up there in, in, in my late teens, 15, 16 years old. Excuse me. And um, that was their champion, man. And that's who I saw in all the magazines, but I had never seen him wrestle until I didn't see him wrestle live. Till I was probably about 20, but I could see him on TV, like 15, 16, like I said. But um, I just remember my grandmother, you know, lived in Baltimore, and that was her all American boy. You know, that was yep. that was her favorite wrestler that didn't do jobs because she had a favorite wrestler and that was SD Jones. As crazy as that sounds, that was her favorite wrestler Really? Uh, because her, well, I don't even know all the details, but something about the mailman looked a lot like about SD Jones. And, um, that was her favorite oh, wrestler. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, granny, the mail's here is all I can tell you. <laughs> uh, that's way back when, when I, you know, I was 15, 16 years old and stuff, people would say, you know, uh, oh, Bobby Smedley, he's the all American boy. You know, he played basketball and ran track and, you know, kept his haircut short and uh, kind of looked like the howdy doody Opie Taylor type, you know, kind of kid. So she always used to say, uh, I bet Bob Backlund, you know, uh, looked like you when he was a boy. And uh, so even when I got into wrestling and stuff, she you know, kept Bob Backlund her favorite because, you know, he's that all American, you know, good looking boy. And she always thought that about me. I proved otherwise, of course, and grew my hair long and drank a lot of beer, but uh, that's beside the point. <laughs> um, but yeah, Backlund, man, and that was the one, too, appeared on some of those, ti- uh, we were talking about uh, after magazines back in the day, and some people sent some out this week, as a matter of fact, Wrestler Weekly did, I think they put some covers where Backlund and Race and uh, um, Flair was on the cover of those, they did some inner, um, what was it, uh, did you, was it Backlund wrestled, um, I think Backlund, I think Backlund and Bachwinkle Claire, wrestled, uh, and I yeah, think Backlund and Race wrestled. Okay, I knew it was something like that. Some of them put their magazines out. Uh, Backlund, he won the title a second time, and I, I had forgotten all about this, to be honest with you. But um, he was in the ring with uh, Bret Hart, and they was going to throw the towel in. And uh, anyway, I guess Stu wouldn't do it, and Owen was there. You know, it was one of the things he was going to screw over his brother as part of an angle. I think this was a short title run. But um, Helen Hart ends up throwing the, t- the towel in that caught breast the match that Backlund won his second title reign. Uh, what did he say? He lost it three days later to Diesel in a non-televised match at the uh, Madison, Square Garden, Madison Square Garden. And one of the things I read about that was uh, I put in quotes, eight seconds. The reason I put that there, apparently um, the way he they did the match and he sold it, he, he beat him in – Diesel beat Backlund like eight seconds, but Diesel – Kevin Nash went on to say that Backlund sold all the way up the aisle, selling his back, and the way he sold it, it helped him get over so much more. And I thought that was really cool, man. Yeah. Um, and the other thing was, real briefly, a quick story about Backlund. I've got to meet him a couple of times. Uh, I was backstage at a WWF taping, and I took my best friend up there at the time, and w- Saw a great star. I went up there and met the guys I knew, of course, and that's when Cornette was there and Sean Watman's and some people I knew, you know. So I, I went in the back and hung out. And this back when was over, being studious as can be. I mean, straight in character. He had his feet on a little suitcase deal. He had his chair, and he was sitting there legitimately reading a book. You know, he was in character the whole time. And my friend popped. I kind of expected that, to be honest with you. But uh, my friend popped big time because we got out there. He's like, man, Bob Backlund. He's just like that, isn't he? He's because he was he was seriously sitting there studying, you know, reading a book like everyone else is going to catering and doing this and that. And I was like, yeah, that's that's that must be who he is. That's that's your character, you know. That's he's he's Bob Backlund, you know. Yeah. And I think my friend finally caught on, like, oh, okay, these guys, some of these guys live this gimmick twenty four seven because that's really who they are, you know, not 
just that 10 or 20 minutes they're out there in the ring or during a TV promo or whatever. I thought it was really cool at Backland. Here he was on the road, you know, in Huntington, West Virginia, in the back, just sitting there reading a, uh, reading a book, you know, and, and studying. I thought that's pretty cool. Of course, he's well known for his conditioning, too. Um, and the chicken wing, he done that. Oh, I guess yeah. that's what he beat uh, Brett with, uh, the chicken wing. And he... Anyway, I can't say enough good things about him except for uh, I know my grandmother. That was one of her favorite wrestlers. I, I put him up there as top babyface wrestler she liked. <laughs> Bob Backlund was a legit, I mean, just totally legit wrestler. And yeah. probably probably the last, uh, maybe the last legitimate wrestler to really hold the world title scene. Yeah, um, he, you know, he wrestled uh, All-American. I mean, jeez. Mm-hmm. uh I'll tell you this. How about this? We started talking about a book club. We're going to yeah. do this this week. We'll have book. We're going to get to that, folks. If you're interested, let us know. I talked to one of our, uh, oh, shoot, one of our fans last night. I think it was Sparks, if he's out there. Yeah, I think it was him. We was talk, uh, I'm going to try to get Lenny Denton's book. That's going to be my next book I'm going to get. But um, I know it's a little bit off topic because um, there's a couple of books. Uh, shoot. Uh, me and you both have it. I've already read it. I had it on PDF file. It was uh, Gary Hart's book. That's kind of what started the conversation. Kind of going around the world here, folks, but uh, bear with me. Uh, this book I come across, Jeremy, I may put this on my list, and it might be something that our wrestling fans out there will be interested in. Bob Backlund has a book. It's his autobiography. It's called The All-American Boy, Lessons and Stories of Life from Wrestling Legend Bob Backlund. It came out in 2015. It's a 352-page book. Um, it's got interviews with Roddy Piper, Ric Flair, The Iron Sheik, and Vince McMahon. And I know you already set up a link for that. So wrestling fans, if you want to, you can get this book by going to tinyurl.com slash bbbobbacklin, okay? tinyurl.com slash bbbobbacklin. And if you've got any other book recommendations out there, uh, like we talked about Stan Hansen's book last week, um, we've talked about before, I think, The Death of the Territories many episodes ago. Yep. We talked about my books, and, and, and I know you got Rock Rim's book you're reading right now in history. Yep. Um, and like I said, I'm going to read uh, Lynn Denton's book, uh, The Grappler. I think that's my next wrestling book read that I'm going to get. So uh, if you got suggestions out there, send them in to us because Professor and myself were avid readers. And I think, Jeremy, a lot of our fans are readers as well. Uh, they're educated. I know that. Yeah, we definitely. Um, you know, we, we kind of hit this thing where our, our listeners, our fans here of this show, yes, they're, they're wrestling fans, but they're wrestling historians too, like many of them. Like uh, I think it was – one of our listeners sent me a picture of the 1928 wrestling and boxing rules book from the state of Mississippi. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, you know, he said one of these days he'll open it up, but not until he figures out how to preserve it first. There you uh, go. There um, you yeah. Um, you know, it's funny, Lynn Denton. So I, I watched, uh, some matches from Florida Friday night, right? Okay. And the grappler and rip Oliver versus Hector and Chavo Guerrero. Okay, that's what you sent me, I think, right? Yep, I think that's Good the deal. first match on there, yeah. I think I'll be watching that this evening. Yep, it's, no, it's a hell of a show. Um, you know, unfortunately, Rick Martell doesn't show up to fight Bockwinkle, so Bockwinkle just stomps the shit out of some other guy. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But it's it's a good show. Uh, you know what's really awesome? Road Warriors versus Hanson and Harley Race for the AWA. Oh, yeah. For the AWA tag titles, yep. That's, I'll be a couple beers deep by the time that one hits, so I'll be right yep, for it, man, because I can't stuff. recall seeing that, man. Yeah. All right. Well, thank All right. You. Yep. All Let's right. get on to number on. Yes. number two. Um, some know him as Terry Bollea, but we all know him as Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Beat the Iron Sheik on January 23rd, 1984, to win the WWF title. That's the match I was alluding to earlier. I went back and watched that match and the Andre match where he slammed Andre at WrestleMania 3. Um, you know, we probably can't say too much uh, wrong with Hulk Hogan because he changed the world of professional yeah. wrestling in what, like 1985, so throughout the 80s. Um, and I was thinking about this. I don't know if I'm wording this right because – we know Vince bought up a lot of territories, and you can hate Vince or think, you know, he killed off your favorite territory. But he gave guys a way to make a hell of a lot more money than what they're probably making. And I was thinking maybe actually Hulk Hogan, with, along with uh, uh, VKM, 
they might have actually saved wrestling too, you know, because of Cable and having his big vision and having such a superstar in Hulk Hogan. I mean, he already appeared in what Rocky three at that time. We was yep. talking about that a little bit last week, just so over. And when he pinned, uh, uh, Sheiky baby on that match, I watched the other day. I mean, when he come down the aisle, it was, I mean, the roof was coming off the place, you know, just, and they, of course they had playing out of the tigress before he had the all American, I'm an all American boy or man or whatever it was. Yeah. But, uh, cause he's fresh off of that. Like I said, Rocky three, but then, you know, he, she kicks out a couple. He kicks out the leg earlier in the match. With I thought, oh, that's great. Like I said, I'm not wasn't shitting on the match itself. Just you know, just like that's the different kind of stuff I'm used to, or I prefer. But you know, he he did a back elbow. And Sheik sold that, and he did did. Then he dropped an elbow, and it was like really impressive to see it because it was almost like almost like a movie set looking thing mm-hmm. when he dropped it, you know. And then he drops the leg the second time and and takes the pin to place. Just absolutely goes nuts, man. And um, just like I said, Hogan is just so over it's unreal man um but the most recognized wrestling star worldwide and most popular wrestler of the 1980s and hell that just um that he still today is, is is so well recognized i mean there's no way you can cannot see his picture and not know who he is anywhere probably in the world i can imagine yeah you know. N- non non-wrestling fans would be able to recognize him yeah you know yeah. that's that's just how it is you know what i find funny about hulk hogan is he was working for new york and Vince, I believe it was Vince Sr., told him not to do that bit in Rocky Three. Well, he went ahead and did it, so he got fired and he went to work for Vern. Mm-hmm. Vern wouldn't take him serious as a title contender because he wasn't a true wrestler. He was a powerhouse. Yeah. Well, by then, Vince Jr. had bought the company from his old man, and Vince was headed the direction he was headed. Yeah. He took Hogan. He took uh, Bobby the Brain Heenan. Dr. D. David Schultz, Mean Gene. I mean, he mm-hmm. just he just got to the score there, and then Hulk Hogan was the was pro wrestling throughout the eighties, and I'd say you know, yeah. and a second time in the nineties, but by then he was long gone from the WWF. Right. But for the first time since the fifties, wrestling was occasionally on on broadcast uh, network TV instead of a cable channel or or syndication. Yeah, you know Saturday night's main event on NBC would draw huge fucking. Right. They they would draw audiences now that wrestling would shit their pants if a wrestling company saw that they wouldn't know what to do with that many eyeballs on them. Right. You know the guy was just he was huge, just yeah. just a gigantic presence on the scene. You know I'm not a big fan of his work, but I will not knock his place in pro wrestling history. And yeah. you talk about McMahon and Hogan saving pro wrestling, you might be right because. Guys like um, Jim Crockett, he was going to go national regardless of what. Yeah. It didn't matter what Vince McMahon was doing. Vern had been basically going national since 63. Yeah. You know, every area. Yeah, I was just thinking about that, how to word it, because I was like, they they may have actually saved it. I don't I don't know, but I'm thinking, you know, like you said, Vern had been, he'd been in a lot of places uh, just outside of that Midway territory. And then, like I said, Crocus, as we know, what happened, you know, they kept expanding, going to Chicago and then, then to Denver eventually, then, then out to California, to L.A. and, and, and San Fran and mm-hmm. those places. So, yeah, it's not like that someone else didn't have the, the vision. They just didn't. They may have thought about it. They didn't have the vision that Vince did. Yeah. And then, then he got that vehicle to drive it, and that was Hulk Hogan. He's like, "Here, here's the captain of the ship, right here, man. Here's our, here's our, uh, you know, Captain Kirk, so to say. We're gonna put this motherfucker in overdrive, and we're gonna go coast to coast, you know, and worldwide. Just the right time for everything, too. If the way cable was hitting the country at that time, as we all know. So I don't know. I, I, I was just putting that out there, like, uh, with a positive spin on it. For as much as we sometimes people think, you know, well, Vince did this, and Vince did that, but you know what? Vince done a lot of damn good things too. Yeah, he did. Um, yeah. So just wanted to put that out there to people. Jim Crockett Promotions does not get the credit or the blame it deserves for what happened to wrestling because he was gobbling up NWA territories left and right. Yeah. And what, by 85, he had a solid lock on the world championship. Yeah. It was not, yeah, it did not go outside his area by 85, you know, and that's why, you know, you start seeing all these other companies start declaring their independence and making their, their own world champions. Well, if you're, if you're the, you know, Fritz down in Dallas, and Ric Flair and Harley Race used to come through, you know, twice a year or three times a year. And now all of a sudden, nobody's coming through. Well, what do you do? You know? Yeah. I mean, that's just, you know, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Um, well, before we go on to number one here, Jeremy, I just want to bring us up. 
all you guys, I didn't even start a timer for this episode. I just want to let people know this will probably go close to an hour, if not over an hour. Um, like I said, I want everyone to know we're just two guys talking wrestling. we got one more to go, and we're going to finish up here. So I just kind of want to put that out there. Generally, we like to keep our shows around 45 minutes to an hour. If we go over a little bit today, we hope you've enjoyed the ride down the street or the bar, uh, a beer at the bar with us. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, and again, we, we talked about this earlier. Uh, we actually enjoyed, not that I didn't enjoy anything I watched with WWF this week or anything I read about. I enjoyed it a lot more when I was doing the NWA. In the, the pre-NWA, the professor did a lot of homework. Now, he already had it done or, or done a lot more for his going to start his own podcast thing. So I appreciate that because I learned so much about the, N, the pre-NWA, about the world title. NWA, I was like, oh, yeah, this is great, man. This is great. Love the you know footage that I watched and reading. Same thing with AWA. The thing is, we probably went over on this one here because we had a lot to choose from, but we had to narrow it down to just, that's why we had you know two honorable mentions, then a special mention, and then our top five. So I uh, hope you've enjoyed the ride or a beer at the bar with us. But, Jeremy, who is number one all-time on this WWE list of champions? Well, number one is going to be Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah, six-time world champion right there, two-time Intercontinental champion, four-time WWF tag team champion. Uh, he was a fifth Triple Challenge champion and Triple Challenge crown champion in WWE history. He won his first title at WrestleMania 14 and helped beating Bre- uh, Shawn Michaels. Sorry, say Brett Michaels. Shit, he don't even be in a wrestling ring. No. Uh, beating Shawn Michaels, and he held it for 91 days. That was his first title reign. And I'll go let you say a couple words there. We'll just talk about maybe his – make us brief about his title reigns. And, again, it's not that we didn't want to leave anyone modern or current off his list. This is just our fucking list. Deal with it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, you can disagree and, you know – Stuff it in a fucking sack, as far as I'm concerned. But Stone Cold Steve Austin, I believe he outsold, outsold Hulk Hogan as world champion. Yes, yes. I uh, think in 98 he did. That's when the year he really busted out on merchandising. Mm-hmm. And he became the legitimate, from my re- recollection, of traveling a lot back in those days, 97, 98, 99, uh, always watching a competition. I think in 98... Um, Stone Cold Steve Austin, he became the six million dollar man, and he, I think Hogan's merch merch had been like at five million or something, and that was the record for the company at the time. And and uh, that year, Stone Cold did like six million dollars in merch, and they said he is the six million dollar man. Uh, it went on to say in this article, and again, I'm I'm just going by uh, memory here. If I'm not mistaken, it said Vince McMahon only made. $86 million that year. So, I mean, that's a shitload of money for him to make $80 million and, and, and Stone Cold to make $6 million. That's a lot of damn money. It just shows the kind of money they were generating back in the day when Stone Cold, you oh, know, yeah. uh, passed, passed Hogan's merch, you know, up and become so so over, if you will. Yeah, so, well. Anyway. Yeah, he, Stone Cold, you know, I guess it would be between him and Rock, yeah. maybe, at this time period, who would just be, like, the biggest star in wrestling. Uh, Stone Cold was cooler than anybody else, I'll tell you that. He was a cool heel. That's yeah. what kind of changed things, too, if you remember that. People felt like it was all right to cheer, cheer for the heel, you know. Um, probably one of the first guys for that to happen, too, wouldn't you say? Um, yeah, I mean, not not for you and me, but for the no, for, yeah, 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 for the audience as a whole. Yeah. Um, who, who, they, who they booked for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he... For the heels. Yeah, you know, his, his, his launching of... Um, you know, Austin 316, he had cool catchphrases, yeah. uh, he looked like a badass, you know, he whipped everybody's ass in the ring, he talked like a tough guy, told the boss to kiss his ass, he did all the shit we all wanted to do. Right, and he drank beer at the end of it all. Yep. <laughs> all the way to the bank. That's so, it, that's yeah, it. Uh, he, uh, uh, he won a third title, was over, over the Rock at WrestleMania 15. Um, I wasn't sure about this one here, it said over Undertaker, I'm not so sure that he, anyway, it said it lasted 55 days for a shortest run of the title. Uh, his fifth title was The Rock at WrestleMania 17. It lasted 175 days. And his sixth one was the win over Kurt Angle. My question was on my notes, I put on that fourth title, I don't, was The Undertaker champion and he beat him? I, I, I'm, it was it a deal of him and Kane? What was the deal there? Do you recall that at all? I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just no. don't recall that. That particular match or what happened, Bobby? I would have to go look into that. Um, yeah, I, I'm. If anyone out there knows on that one title, the one I couldn't, 
I, my notes, my fourth title reign, I'm not so sure that's correct. The other ones all should be correct when he beat Michaels and The Rock and, those, and Angle and those places. But, um, yeah, Stone Cold, you know, he took that, that gimmick, that Stone Cold killer. You know, he was doing that ringmaster uh, thing that wasn't really getting over. It wasn't really him. And, um, he's you know, his hair's already getting a little bit, you know, bald up top and or losing some hair, I guess. He shaves his head. He grows a goatee. And this is whole persona. Just that, you know, it just comes out, man. And I think everyone knew from the time he stepped in the ring early on from way back early in his career this guy's got something you know had the body he could talk and he could work and he got in the ring that's the thing about stone cold people i think respect when you're talking about you know flipping off the boss and and and, and yelling at the boss and 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 getting over people so i think people also respected his hard work he worked his ass off in that ring man um so I think a lot of people respect that. One other thing I was going to say, too, about the Undertaker deal. I do know this. I haven't listened to a podcast for a while, but about a year ago, uh, uh, he had a guest on there, um, and he was telling a guest that he was working with the uh, – working a program at the Undertaker. Now, I, again, I, I don't think he beat him for that championship, just that fourth one. But anyway, he said there's nothing like in the world when he was in the ring and the Undertaker music hit. He said, even a grown ass man like myself, he said, just the, the, the jitters and the thrill and the electricity that went through your body when that Undertaker's music hit. He said, if you're in an arena as a fan, he said, I'm talking about when I'm in the ring to work with them. He said, it just, it, I'm getting chill bumps telling us the way he was telling his story. I thought that's pretty cool though, you know, talking about being over. Here you are over as a champion, a grown ass man, probably as, you know, early to mid thirties at that time or whatever. And, uh, still getting chills like, Oh fuck, here comes the undertaker. You know, I thought that's pretty cool, man. But, uh, again, one of those guys, you probably can't say a good, enough good stuff about, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. I never met him, believe it or not. Um, he was leaving. He left WCW by the time I got there. I do have one fun story. I'll tell you real quickly and I'll let you finish up some things before we get ready to get off here. But I was uh, out in uh, Texas for WCW doing TV tapings and, um, uh, end up riding with Chris Adams of all people. And, uh, so we're riding down the street. Of course, he, you know, he worked that territory. He's over in what WCCW and, and, and way back in the day, you know what a star he was. Uh, -huh. uh so Chris Adams and I driving down the street. I'm driving. We're like heading from Dallas to Corpus Christi or somewhere like that. Long ass driving. We're just talking. I'm like, well, what do you, you know, what do you, we just got talking. So he said, um, yeah, he's talking about his wrestling school. And we're just driving down the street, and I'm, like, drawing a blank, and he's just talking, and I'm just like, this is a long-ass ride or whatever. And he starts talking about this wrestling school. So I just look over, and I kind of smart asses, and I say, do you train anyone I might have heard of or what? <laughs> Dude, he shot me a look. I looked over at him. He shot me a glare, and I did say kind of smart ass. I'd worked with Chris a couple of times. How we end up rooming together, I don't know. I'll just leave it at that. The people, you do crazy things sometimes. <laughs> I just, But he got, I looked over. Uh, he was, his eyes were like that laser cat burning through me. And he looked at me and goes, you ever fucking heard of Stone Cold Steve Austin? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit. I came back to reality real quick and I'm like, oh fuck man, I'm sorry. Yeah. And he goes, yeah. He goes, uh, yeah. You know, he married Max's wife, you know. <laughs> I talk to him all the time. My kids live there. And he started to browbeat me, and I'm like, fuck you, you know? But it's just really funny because he was like, you ever heard of Stone Cold Steve? I was like, shit, then it hit me. I like, I knew that story, but I didn't, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're just on a long, lost highway out in Texas somewhere. But anyway, Stone Cold probably can't say enough good things about him, Jeremy. Go ahead and take over a little bit because I, I just started thinking about that story as I was telling you that. Well, I mean, <laughs> so. yeah, this was, this was kind of a tricky one because, you know, I was kind of tempted to put Hulk Hogan in this spot, but – yeah. Stone Cold was probably the last real big, cool guy that held the title. He's kind of the guy that shaped what wrestling would be, where, you know, you'd have tweeners that were kind of, I don't know, where people start choosing who they cheered for, whether it be a heel or a face, where they kind of didn't really do heel and face anymore because of him. Um, you know, he, he's got a character that I think everybody's been trying to recapture ever since, kind of like everybody did with Gorgeous yeah. George before that. So Stone Cold is going to go down as our number one most consequential WWE champion of all time. Um, and with that, I've kind of shot my load there, Bobby. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. In addition to telling everyone to be careful out there, be kind and stay safe, wear your mask and wash your hands and all that stuff, Professor, I'm just going to say something to you, and I'll leave it at that for this week. And that's this, my friend. 
you know, you hit me in the head with the fucking coconuts. You give me a chair shop, the Acme chairs. You got me with the damn uh, Algonquin guitars, whatever the hell they were. I'm just going to say this. I've let you get away with this stuff too long, man. So you got the name of professor for a reason because all the knowledge you shared with us and all these notes and stuff, I appreciate it very much. But I'll tell you what I'll do to your ass. I'll Gilligan Island your ass. I'll just I'll just leave you the professor. I'll leave your ass out there on a three hour cruise and, and then forget about you for a couple of weeks. How about that, Professor? <laughs> we'll just leave your ass out there on Gilligan's Island. Folks, for Jeremy, the Professor, Vilmer, this is Bobby Blaze. Thank you very much, wrestling fans. Until next time, see ya!